Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of All Access. And Happy New Year to everybody. I hope you had a wonderful, uh, wonderful end to 2022. What a year it was. Um, I think we uh, talked about it. We saw some of the huge ups and the huge downs that are in this crypto market. It is a, it's an early, early stage market, early stage set of assets to be formed. The area, the, the fact that these instruments are bearer instruments attracts a certain kind of personality to the space. And that I think lies at the root of, of a lot of our problems. And, um, and so, but we, we persevered and uh, uh, Bitcoin is still over 16,000, Avalanche is still 20 times above uh, what, uh, you know, where it was when it first was, uh, uh, was uh, made public. So um, it's, uh, it's a pretty good situation overall, if you ask me, in terms of adoption. When I talk to people, everybody understands the crypto assets and space. So overall, I think it's, uh, the space has proven, that, proven to be resilient. It's also proven to have certain problems that stem from not so much crypto, but, but the sort of the, the structure of the markets that have grown around crypto. Custodians will always be custodians. And custodians will always be able to, if you try, if, if, you know, traditional custodians will always be in a position where they can misbehave on us. So that's why I think we have to develop new technologies that cut these middlemen out. The FTX type scenarios, those types of failures are just inevitable. Um, they were always inevitable in TradFi. That's why there's a lot of regulation in TradFi. That's half the reason why there's so much regulation in TradFi. The other half the reason there's so much regulation in TradFi is because the incumbents don't want new people to come in. But, uh, but the real the initial reason for having so much regulation was to make sure that uh, these custodians and intermediaries did not misbehave. And, uh, but with crypto, we can actually cut these people out and we can put in the kinds of rails in place that keep people from misbehaving, that keep processes from misbehaving. Anyhow, so uh, it was a great year in many ways. It was a terrible year in many other ways, and it's up and down. But uh, but if I look, you know, at the 10-year picture, when I first noticed Bitcoin 11 years ago, whenever it was, 10 years ago, um, and uh, uh, or whenever it was, I, I lose track now. But uh, however many years it's been, um, the the adoption curve is up and to the right. The important curves that we all care about in terms of institutions, in terms of users, in terms of number of assets, in terms of actual useful people doing things that they couldn't do before, up and to the right. And in many ways, it's no different from the way the internet revolution worked. And back then also, there were a bunch of incumbents saying all sorts of things. You might remember, content is king. All the media companies were out there saying the internet is going to change nothing. Well, where are they now? They're being bought out by internet companies. Um, so there were all sorts of telecom companies. I remember how big AT&T was. I, I bet you do too. I bet you remember how terrible the treatment was from the phone companies to their users. And I bet you remember how for 60, 70 years, there was no, no innovation whatsoever in the telecom space. The one thing they invented was the flash button. So you never knew when you hung up whether or not you actually hung up, right? You could have pressed the button a little too quickly and the person was still there. So uh, that was their innovation. And there's a good reason for that. That's because their architecture was centralized. We had dumb machines in our hands. We were clients to a set of servers. And the people who operated those servers, they collected a monthly check. And there was no competition whatsoever to be had. And the interface they gave us was a dial tone. And that's how they kept us at bay for so many years that all they fed us was a simple dial tone and they collected billions over billions over years and, uh, and without allowing anybody to innovate. And the main thing that the internet did was the fact that it opened up that space to innovation. And that then flooded in a whole lot of new things to come in. And what I see in crypto is exactly a duplicate of exactly that same process. Financial rails are now open and democratized. Does that mean that there will be people every now and then, like Sam Bankman fried like psychopaths, or not sociopaths, I should say, sociopaths who essentially are going to say anything and do anything, you know, adopt the cause of effective altruism when, when it suits their needs, say all sorts of things about, you know, whatever it is that people want to hear, they will say that to collect money and run with it. This is just, this, it happens. It will happen every now and then, and we will work those these people out of our system. So anyhow, um, so what, uh, what I wanted to do this year was, uh, was sort of take a step back like one does 
and uh, think about why we are doing what we're doing. Okay, so we have been seeing all these bad actors, and if you sort of allow the the news to flood you, then you're going to see, you know, polycule this and you know, weird party in the Bahamas that, and like Sam did that, and you know, this and that. There's just going to be a whole lot of uh, lurid details, and uh, and it's it's easy to get to get sidetracked from the main mission uh, on hand. The main mission on hand is so clear and so simple, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about it. And uh, and so, in fact, what I really want to do is spend the next couple of weeks. Um, telling you and giving you some vignettes that I have observed in my private life uh, about um, processes that go wrong because there are people that we have to trust and because those people abuse that trust. Or there are processes that we have to trust, we don't know how to adequately audit them, and then they go awry. So I want to talk to you about them. This is, I started a bunch of uh, Twitter threads with the hashtag, this is why we crypto. And um, and so I try to sort of distill them into like Twitter format, these threads and so on. Uh, they're very terse. And I think uh, it's kind of kind of fun to go over these things uh, for those of you who uh, may or may not have heard about these things before and uh, give you my sort of impression on why it is that we're doing the things we're doing, why it is that the things we're doing cannot be duplicated elsewhere, why it is that in the future people have to use these technologies because there's a set of functionality here that just doesn't exist in TradFi. So um, I think I started this thread, or this series of, of threads with, uh, with, a, with a look at, at Dole Corporation. Now, those of you who are old enough will remember Bob Dole. And uh, it is the same Bob Dole family. It's that Dole family. Uh, you know, so you might, you might have all sorts of opinions about this family and what they do, and none of them matters. And I certainly do, and none of them matters. Right? It's a family that went down to South America. They did a whole bunch of things with, with a bunch of republics down there, and they're the main importers of fruit, especially bananas, et cetera, et cetera. So they certainly meddled in South, South American politics. Let's leave all that aside for a second. So, but there's a colorful, um, colorful side, side story there as well. But um, at the end of the day, Dole Corporation is a corporation like every other, and it has shares. And, uh, and so, so the following thing happened to them that not that many people know about because mainstream media pushed it under the rug. They really swept it. And it, they did such a great job that, uh, that when you look at it, it's actually really hard to find, uh, what, find out what happened, to find, to find the actual facts, the, the sort of series of events that led us to where we are. And nobody actually followed up with the subsequent. What's the subsequent? Did the thing that happened to, to Dole also happen to other corporations? And did we all suffer from lower valuations in our 401k plans and our retirement plans? And I think the answer is a resounding yes, it has to be. But I never saw anybody actually get to the bottom of it. So I wanna tell you what happened with Dole. Dole. It is fairly straightforward. So uh, there's a CEO at the head of Dole Corporation, Bob Dole has passed away, of course, the family or whatever, it was a family. Once, once upon a time, it was a family company, then it becomes a, a, a publicly traded company there's a CEO. The CEO decides, hey, the valuation, and this is going to be important later on. There's a reason why he's deciding this. He says, the valuation, the market cap for our company is too low. It's so low that I want to take this company private. I can find money from various sources. I can buy out every single share. And then it becomes private. And then, of course, you know, the, the, the return on my investment is going to be higher this way than to keep this thing afloat in public markets. So, um, so that's fine, he can decide that. And uh, so these things are trading at some, some value. The shares are trading at some value. Then uh, he decides to make, a, make a, 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 a transaction to take the company private at, I forget the number, let's say 12.95 a share or something. So, uh, so he, he wants to do this and he's got the board on his side, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's about to happen and uh, but then there's a, there's a lawsuit from the shareholders saying, no, this is too low. This, this price at which this person is taking it private is too low. And the lawsuit is settled. And, um, and the settlement terms say, everybody who held shares of Dole Corporation now has a claim to, I forget the amount, about two extra dollars. It should be like $14.95 as opposed to $12.95, something of that magnitude. Okay, well then how is that gonna get settled? 
Well, it's going to get settled by everybody who holds all shares sending in a letter and making a claim saying, hey, I was a shareholder. You owe me two bucks you know, per share. And uh, it's fairly straightforward. And, uh, and there, there used to be at the time, uh, Dole Corporation had issued 36 million shares. So they expect, you know, potentially up to 36 million claims. They want to pay, of course, up to 72 million extra dollars. That's sort of a sensible thing to do, given all the terms and conditions. Well, so they open up a website and uh, claims start coming in. And uh, lo and behold, there is about, I forget the numbers again, about 49 million claims for 36 million shares. That is to say, in aggregate, there are about 5,000 people who in totality, they believe they hold 49 million shares. Well, how could they think that? Well, they think, you know, they can't, it can't possibly be true that they held that many shares because there aren't that many shares to go around. There are only 36 million of them. And yet there are 49 million people out there who think that they hold those shares. So in Sam's, uh, you know, immortal words, what happened, right? So well, what happened is this, Wall Street had one job. Now one job is to keep careful track of accounting. The entire system that we believe in collapses if these guys are manufacturing shares left and right. The entire valuation system is broken if you think you issued 100 shares and these guys are trading 200 of your shares, that 100 of which you did not issue. Well, who got that money? Where did that come from? Who's got that wealth in their pocket? It's entirely broken if the system is able to manufacture assets out of the thin air. The entirety of everything in our, in our portfolios, in our, in our retirement accounts is, is undermined if, <laughs> if these guys, if TradFi cannot keep track of a simple aggregate uh, sum. And so in this case, they clearly failed. They had one job and they failed. And, and you can go and, you know, like, this is why we crypto is closely coupled with you had one job, right? So this, this one job was make sure that you don't create assets out of the thin air. So, um, so what happened in the case of Dole? Well, so it turns out that, you know, obviously TradFi systems are fairly complicated. It's just, I have my database, you have your database, everybody has their databases, and there's like some accounting of exactly who has uh, which assets, there are all sorts of clearing houses, there are exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a, a, a complicated mess that's difficult to describe here in words. I, I would need a, a blackboard behind me and, and 15 minutes to sort of get through uh, the structure of, a, of even a simplified uh, market. But, uh, but in this case, what exactly failed was this. Um, on occasion, as you know, there are big moves in, uh, in asset prices. And when you have big moves, the, uh, the exchanges shut down. And uh, so when the exchanges shut down due to these moves, you know, like suddenly all assets go down by 10%. There's like fear of war. There's this, that, and the other. So um, the markets are shut down. But there, yet there are people out there with very big positions, and they still want to trade. So they have these alternative uh, trading venues that where they can trade on the side, and then they, they are supposed to re-reconcile with the main, uh, main exchanges and of course, you can't be going to those places and, 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 and trading things that, that you don't have. Uh, and there are supposed to be a gazillion safeguards to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. Well, lo and behold, um, you know, I don't know how surprised you are, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, lo and behold, they lost track. And the system in aggregate, in, in, in sort of uh, you know, working the way it does, allowed people to trade things that they didn't have. The, the re-reconciliation -re screwed things up. And more people ended up thinking that they ended up, they, that they own Dole shares than there are Dole shares. Now, what's the impact of this on price? Well, you know they manufactured 33% extra shares, so that's huge. So you might think, okay, well then the share price must be three, you know, 33% higher. Well, no, not really. It all depends on the demand curve, right? So uh, you know, there's a set of people who are interested in an asset that say. There's a uh, you know 110 people and there are 100 assets, so those uh, nobody wants to be in the last remaining 10. Those people will start bidding each other up, uh, so that uh, so that the asset price goes up and it's not going to go up by 10 percent. It's going to go up by you know whatever the the demand curve uh, is asking for. Um, so uh, so these guys ended up manufacturing a third more 
assets than there, there really are assets. So the impact is, in my opinion, at least 33%, possibly far more. No wonder the CEO wanted to take that company private because its value was so depressed. And it was so depressed because these guys could not uh, keep, their, uh, keep their accounting straight. It's absolutely astounding. The whole story is astounding. And do you think that Dole is kind of special? That Dole assets are, you know, they were able to be manufactured this way, but, uh, but then, you know, IBM wasn't. You know, not for a second. And, and you can't, one of the issues, of course, with, uh, with these guys is you can't do an accounting, you can't do a, a safety check of the system, right? It's, uh, they're decentralized in a way that's completely unaccountable. You have to trust all of the custodians. So anyhow, so this is why we crypto. This is one of the main reasons why we crypto is because you want, you want the custodians to not be able to manufacture things that don't exist. It's one of the main reasons, the, one of the central tenets of, of Bitcoin's value proposition is that you know, the, the, the issuance rate for the asset should be set. And of course, you should not be able to trade something you don't have. So uh, can this happen in crypto? Well, it can happen in crypto if you bring in TradFi structures into crypto. Okay, TradFi structures come into crypto for two reasons. One, performance. When, uh, you know, when you want to, to trade on a platform that's super, super fast and uh, you can't get that speed on, a, on, a, on chain, well, then you end up going to a, 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 a market, a centralized exchange like FTX, and the FTX guys can lie to you through their teeth all day long like Sam did to us. Um, what else can happen? Uh, you can get, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so that's, that's one way. That's one reason why, um, why, uh, uh, why this can happen. Um, hang on, let me just have a sip of my tea for a second. And um, uh, there, there, are, um, uh, there, there are many other reasons for why people might go to, uh, to, uh, to, to this kind of a structure. So uh, the second reason is on-chain, you might not want to, to, to transact um, on-chain. Why? Because people front run you on-chain. If you try to do anything on Uniswap, there's going to be somebody sandwiching you or front running you or what have you. They're going to be extracting MEV because the underlying protocols are, are open to it. So it's a, it's a really, really bad situation. And we find ourselves in the hands of centralized operators. And then those operators can lie to us. But if you truly use crypto the way it's intended to be used, and if you use properly vetted systems, you use, for example, fully encrypted exchanges where the exchange operator cannot engage in malfeasance like Enclave. Uh, that market. If you go to enclave.market, you can do trades and the operator has no power to even observe your trade. Like they just don't know. And uh, uh, so, so these kinds of systems just take out the opportunity for the centralized exchange operator to engage in these kinds of behaviors. And, and uh, I don't know what else to say. It's like, are we going to spend our whole lives, like the next, you know, umpteen decades, you know, trusting people, sending, you know, inspectors and auditors after the fact, and then uncovering some kind of a scandal every now and then. We just uncovered the FTX scandal to the tune of many, many billions. Uh, before then, there were all sorts of scandals on Wall Street. Every, every half a decade, there's a major one that we hear about. And I'm sure there are many others that are also uh, sort of quietly dealt with behind the scenes. So, uh, so are we going to do that or are we going to have far better rails? I don't know. What do you think? No, so I mean, it's it, the answers. I think uh, just uh, present themselves, uh, you know, at, immediately. That that crypto is a far better foundation for building uh, any kind of financial structure than what we have. The other thing I want to talk to you about is another story. Hang on, I have to bring this up though because uh, because without it, I lose my track of thought. But uh, um, I want to talk to you about um, this uh, this thing that happened with the Department of Defense. So um, that's, uh, that's a separate issue with, uh, with, um, uh, with a couple of uh, airplane parts that, uh, that caused uh, a lot of airplanes to be grounded. I think, uh, hang on, I have to find my own tweet thread to remember exactly what happened here. But um, uh, the years and so forth, uh, I, uh, I kind of uh, forget. But the bottom line is this. So um, the, the, the Department of Defense, ended up grounding its entire fleet of, um, of F-35 fighter jets because 
they just could not tell whether or not the uh, the parts you know placed inside the the the, the vehicles that pl placed inside the planes were actually genuine parts that were meant to be there. So why is this important? Well, this is kind of critical. And uh, I don't know if you if you've noticed this or heard the, about this during uh, the various wars we had over the last few decades. Uh, one of the typical things that that any nation does to mess with the other side is this. Um, you end up constructing, usually they use mortar rounds, and this is, I think, the most visceral argument I can give you for why it's important to, uh, to use blockchain-like techniques for, uh, for guarding what goes inside, uh, inside uh, something you care about, whether it's a plane or something else. Let me give you the example with mortar shells. So something that many, many, many armies uh, engage in is a fake withdrawal where they leave behind certain shells. So typically they use mortar shells for this because the mortars, you know, you have to be physically on top of the shell, on top of the, the, the mortar, um, the, the, whatever it is, the device, um, uh, when, when you're placing the shell inside. So what you do is you take some shells and normally there's like a, like a little primer at the bottom and a propellant. And then of course, there's the thing that you're the projectile that goes off and, you know, if you're lucky, you know, if you go and hit your enemy and it explodes by the enemy. What you do is you take out the propellant, you put the explosive right there. And so when you drop the mortar shell, it goes to the bottom of the, the, the mortar itself and the primer then explodes the thing right there with all of your soldiers around it and it explodes right then and there. Now, why would you do this? Well, you, you manufacture this and then you do a fake withdrawal and you go, oh no, I left behind a whole lot of ammunition. Look at that, oh my. And then of course the people who find this um, they might be stupid enough to say, oh, look, you know, we got some free ammo. Let's use it. And if they use it, of course, you don't do it to every single shell. You do it to every hundredth or so or whatever it is. You pick your number. And, uh, and then they drop it in. And every now and then with some percent probability, it just explodes and kills everybody around, uh, around that, uh, that, uh, you know, that station. So uh, you don't want this happening, nor do you want the F-35 to have parts in it that have been sourced from China. And that's exactly what happened in this case. So, and once that's discovered, then you just go, oh no, like then now like, you, you, got, you have a problem. Can you trust this machine? Is it an actual integral thing as, as you planned it? Or did some parts come from somebody that you just cannot trust? And clearly when that happens, it's a big deal. This is not like, oh yeah, I guess we'll just kind of call it a day. People will literally fall out of the sky if you do. And you do need that kind of a, a, a way to check what went into this thing, where did it come from, and uh, was it was it would it be maintain a chain of custody all throughout? So this is it's no easy task, and this is true for planes. It's true for car parts. When I get my car done, I definitely want to make sure that when I pay for an original part, I want to get an original part. I want it to be a Volkswagen, whatever the hell, or whatever whatever I'm driving. So. Um, so it's absolutely critical. Um, and uh, there's other examples of this as well. So yeah, in 2020, uh, there's a, a lieutenant that, uh, that, uh, that uh, died, who died because his ejection seat failed. And the ejection seat failed because there was a counterfeit part. Like this is no joke. There are people who literally die as a result of our inability to keep track of, uh, of, of, uh, of provenance for parts. So these supply chain problems are really, really important. And there have been many people who have touched upon this. And it seems like, you know, there's like, you're going to hear all sorts of noise around it. And the people who jump in uh, to, to address issues like this are not necessarily the ones who are the best suited to, to pick the right domain or to pick the right solution. So what do I mean by that? Well, IBM and Walmart did a bunch of supply chain things, OK? And supply chain things for Walmart are probably the worst examples of how you want to do this, okay? So um, the, there are many, many, many uh, obstacles to doing supply chains right. One of them, the, one of the main ones, is the tie between the thing you're buying and the actual the and the and its representation on chain. Okay, so uh, unless so often you will hear people say the following thing: unless you somehow integrally implement something, put some ID device into the thing you're selling that cannot be ripped out and replaced by a copy, uh, then, then this thing is worthless. They're going to say something like this. It's going to sound convincing. So why is this? Well, look, if you're selling me a Louis Vuitton bag and um, I'm buying, I'm not going to buy a Louis Vuitton. 
talk about, whatever it is, suppose I'm buying it. Um, and there is some identifier in it and I can use the blockchain to check to see if it's good or whatnot, whatever. So um, it's easy to counterfeit this. So there are two responses to this. It's like, whenever I hear this, I just go, look, this is a discarded, discarded thing. Uh, but because there have been no good people who really went out and did it right, we're just all kind of staring at each other, just kind of scratching our heads and, and just the argumentation is stuck at like 2015. We haven't been able to make progress. There are two easy arguments against this. One, um, if you want to do things the way you, you have in your mind, which is I do a read-only transaction and I check the blockchain to see if the ID in here is an ID that, uh, that the manufacturer placed on the chain. If I'm going to do a read-only transaction, then I, I, you are right. I do need an ID in, the, in, the, in, the, in this device that cannot be, uh, that cannot be easily copied. And it turns out we have technologies for this. They're called PUFFs, uh, P-U-Fs. And uh, these, are, uh, um, it, these are things that, you know, essentially think of it as, the, well, no, there are many different technologies for creating PUFFs, but uh, one of them that I happen to like a lot is you imagine a bunch of microscopic capacitors in a big plastic dough, if you will. And you take a little, you know, drop-sized uh, uh, piece of this, and it has a mix of these capacitors that is unique to that, that drop. You can't easily manufacture this because doing that requires uh, recreating in 3D that exact composition of tiny, tiny, tiny items. And we simply lack the capacity to do that. We lack the technology to do that. So that's one way of putting an ID in something that cannot be uh, copied by someone else. There's many other tech technologies for this. And uh, you know, this is one of the things that you, know, you hear about when you're a professor uh, at Cornell or whatever have you. And, uh, and your colleagues are talking around the, the lunch table about things they're working on. And uh, my colleagues at, at Electrical Engineering uh, were very, very uh, excited about uh, this area. And there's far more going on than uh, what I'm doing. You know, I'm not doing it justice at all. But uh, it's a very exciting field and it's possible to do it this way. But we don't have to be futuristic, nor do I have to be telling you about anything of this kind, because this technology is, is not well applied in this format with a read-only ID embedded in the real device. People who try to do this, they're going to find that it's actually very hard to do. What it's far better for is the other application mode where uh, what you do is uh, you don't target something that's mass, con you know, for mass consumption with like a gazillions of, of items manufactured, et cetera. You target something of, of, of that's of limited issuance where the individuals consuming this thing have a, um, a specific uh, motivation or checking to make sure that they're getting a unique version of this thing and where the interaction with the chain is not read only, but also involves a write. Okay, so the moment you have that, then it's a far different solution. It's a fairly straightforward solution. So at the time you manufacture a bag, a Louis Vuitton bag, for example, you put into it something that says, here is some unique number. It's copyable. I'm not gonna use these puff technologies, PUFs. I'm not gonna use any of those things. Um, I'm going to just put in some little, like, you know, some little tag, like a, like an NFC tag in there. And on the chain, I'm going to put a signature that says this particular tag, I verify that I manufactured it on this date. Da, da, da. It's a genuine one. So could someone manufacture an exact duplicate of the same tag? Yes, they can. But when somebody buys that bag, the first person to check also performs an operation where they register and say, this is a unique one of its kind. This random number on, in this bag is mine. And now if, for you to actually manufacture a, a fake bag, that's not a Louis Vuitton. Well, then you'll have to come that 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 is not going to be, that, that is not, has not been claimed by someone. You'll have to manufacture a random number, not very hard, but then you'll need that signature on chain that says this was manufactured on this date at this facility by Louis Vuitton, the manufacturer. The same goes for plane parts. The same goes for car brakes. The same goes for whatever you care about. And it's a fairly simple check. Very, very straightforward to do. And this is the kind of thing that, uh, for example, at Avalanche, we, uh, we worked with Materium, a startup that was actually doing exactly this for authenticity of, uh, of parts. And it's very, very simple. And all it requires is not coordination and, and, and giant consortia who all have to agree on this, that, and the other, but a simple agreement between the manufacturer and the ultimate consumer. The problem, of course, is it doesn't scale. This is not for checking everything. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be thinking about doing this 
for let's say I don't know what uh, for for pieces of chocolate. Okay, so there's like gazillions of those, and the consumer of chocolate is too busy eating it to to do a transaction on chain. But it applies incredibly well to car parts, to plane parts, to to defense material. Of course, that's where it should be applied. And of course, the IBM Walmart cooperation was going was destined for failure. They were going down the consortia route. They were doing all sorts of fancy stuff. You know, I don't know what state it's in. But, uh, but I could have told you a bazillion years ago that, yes, they're, they're going down the wrong route, wrong structure, wrong architecture, wrong technology. They were using Hyperledger because it was in vogue at the time, just, just destined for uh, nowhere. And, uh, and so this is the kind of thing that we do somehow as a society. It takes uh, forever for us to wise up and realize, hey, this is not the best use of our technology. The sort of the simple minded thinking that you that people have is like, oh, yeah, this is how I saw this, this is typically wrong. You need someone to come in and, and think a little bit critically. It's not even that hard, nor does it take that long. And then you have to find find the uh, identify the use cases where the tech is a good fit. So that too, this the defense example of supply chains and authenticity of parts is another reason why we do crypto. There is no other way I know of being able to do this. Could you do maybe a centralized website? Maybe, maybe, but then, you know, who's going to run that? And won't they just start demanding money from all the people who run that thing? So the nice thing about blockchains is they're a public good. They're open to everyone. And so you create a subnet for these authenticity certificates. People participate. It's open to all. And it doesn't require coordination. And if you don't want to participate tomorrow, that's fine, because I want to participate. And someone else will show up to participate in your stead. And it's not a closed system. No one can then exert monopoly power on the manufacturers. And that is a killer app. I don't know of any other way of structuring this where you don't put somebody into a special position, where that person will then lie, for example, or exert power to try to extract rent from you from all of us so just two examples just want to bring those uh, up for discussion people don't know about this stuff they keep going to these really dumb cases they keep going to these really big companies that have no imagination and don't quite understand the technology for for these use cases and uh, there's so much to do i have you know i prepared a whole bunch of threads uh for the next couple of weeks uh, just sort of, uh, you know, shining light on various different vignettes of, you know, here is what happened in TradFi. Go match this. That you cannot. There will always be these naysayers. And these naysayers are typically software engineers at big, boring companies doing big, boring tasks, mostly collecting data on us, mostly compiling dossiers, and mostly selling our data to other people for a living. And those people have stock options. And they're really, really against against crypto. And it's just what it is. And I keep hearing this, and it's just like, okay, I'm glad you, you sold your soul to work, you know, to work on this like terrible ad-based industry where we end up giving up a part of who we are to get some some service. And instead, you cannot imagine a different way of doing things. So there are far better ways of, of building databases, there are far better ways of building distributed systems, then trust Zuckerberg, trust this, trust that, trust Sam, trust some intermediary. That's what I want to leave you with. Um, and uh, I don't know, that's my sort of what's been on my mind. I've been thinking about all these, like, this is why we crypto. There's so many examples and um, I can't do them justice. And uh, I don't obviously have the time to, to write out all of them. But I just want to give you some examples from different domains. And, uh, and I'm really, really excited about, uh, about what's to come. So that's sort of my big picture. Uh, don't let Sam and others take you down. This is a fun field where we bring something to the table that cannot be held any other way. So no matter what happens, no matter how many regulators come through, no matter how many of these, you know, hey, I've got my stock options and they're going down and I hate you all for uh, building this crypto space that has ups and downs and spikes in this, you know, no matter how many of those come by, we are here to stay because we bring something to the table that nobody else can do. And so that's a really, really powerful situation to be in. And I'm, I'm super happy to be, to be alive at the time when we're doing all this. So let's uh, maybe on that note, wrap that up and uh, I'll stop my rant. And, um, and let's uh, maybe take some questions. Let's see what's going on. Um, okay, let's go to the top. Hello to everyone. Yes, hi fam. Um, 
when are embedded and multi-chain secure smart contracts coming to the core wallet? Well, we have them. We have embedded and multi-chain secure smart contracts, right? So you can do smart contracts on the C chain. You can do smart contracts on any other chain that allows smart contracts. Um, certainly you can do smart contracts on other EVM chains, which we have many of. So, um, and now we have multi-chain communication with, uh, with Warp. So, uh, so this, we've built, I think, the most versatile infrastructure for blockchains and uh, bar none with the quickest finality, with uh, the most uh, uh, accommodating, the most scalable architecture and the most flexible way of, uh, of building any number of chains. There's no limitation. It's not a single chain. Uh, it's, it's just a very elegant infrastructure. So I think the question here is, when is it coming to, to the wallet? And uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that's Q2 this year is, is when I suspect uh, the wallet is going to add functionality for interacting with um, with uh, uh, with uh, smart contracts. The other thing that uh, I think I talked about is uh, is another feature that we're adding to the wallet that I'm, I'm super excited about. So when I go to my wallet, I, I don't want to think of it as a wallet. I want to think of it as my browser for everything financial, for everything blockchain, beyond financial. So uh, what does that mean? Well, and how can one, one person build such a thing or one entity or one whatever? Like how can one thing um, provide a portal to everything there is out there? Because you know, obviously it's one small finite set of people um, providing something that spans uh, and potentially infinitely many uh, different services. How does that happen? Well, I think something that I'm super excited about is an extensible wallet, a wallet where the backend services can drop um, these extensions, and those extensions can then you know, provide essentially think of it as a tab. So you go to your wallet, and over there, if you want to do a swap, then you click on the swap tab, and then it gives you options for doing a swap. If you want to do an interaction with uh, I don't know what with um, uh, with any DeFi with lending, you press the lending you know uh, lending tab, and you get the lending options. And if you don't like that lending tab, then somebody else may have provided a different lending tab. And then you use their lending tab to do whatever it is you want to do on another service. So this is not quite easy to do because essentially what one would have to do is take code provided to you by third parties and then run it in the front end inside a wallet, which potentially has access to uh, very, very private information to, to the keys that, uh, that, uh, uh, that control the funds. So we, we must make sure that that, that happens safely and uh, we're working exactly on that technology to make sure that we can open this this uh, this up such that the uh, the wallet itself can perform actions on the back end without allowing these third parties to steal our funds these things about like authorize OpenSea to do this and that authorize this application to do that that should go away there should be no authorization of any kind all of those authorizations are incredibly dangerous we should just not have them so uh so anyhow, so these are some examples of, of things we're working on, and I'm, I'm super excited about the year ahead. I think uh, Core already with mobile out, so we have Core browser extension, we have Core desktop, and now we have Core mobile. Um, it's, it's a full-fledged product. It's incredibly good. If you haven't tried it, try core.app. It's really, really cool. And, um, uh, and I think in the, in the year to come, it's going to, to just surpass everybody else out there. If you're comfortable with MetaMask, Try core, very different universe. Okay, um, please do not make your posts only in English. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, so I get this a lot, but then again, you know, <laughs> I learned this area in English. I, we, when we invented a lot of these concepts, we thought in English. I published in, in the global language for, uh, for academics, which is currently English. I find it incredibly hard. You have no idea how hard it is for me to use any other language to discuss technical topics, right? So if I ask you to describe, you know, how to make a, I don't know what, how to, if I ask you to talk about, you know, how to have bluefish and, uh, and a little bit of Raku on the side of the Bosphorus in a language other than Turkish, I bet you too will find it impossible because that requires a certain mindset that we picked up in one language and to do it in another language is incredibly hard. So much respect to any simultaneous translators who are, who are able to do that. I find it really, really hard. So, uh, and my audience is global. Yes, I hear you. I would like to, 
on occasion I do these things. I, it's very taxing. I can't do anything you know, for the rest of the day once I do it. It's just so hard. And uh, uh, so, so I just can't, uh, can't be handling that. So uh, my apologies to you all as English, and that's what you're going to get. Um, so uh, favorite club or bar you have been to? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't been to a club in such a long time, such a long time. Um, I think the last one that I went to was Opium in Barcelona during Avalanche Summit, and it was fantastic. So um, uh, I, I bet you there's going to be a whole lot of people who are going to tell me that you know, it's, it's, you know, it's on the decline, it's crappy, whatever. The DJ was great that night, and, um, and uh, uh, it's just the DJ was just great. And, uh, uh, and it, was, it was all the, the Summit crowd, so it was a bunch of crypto people. We had such a blast there. It was wonderful, I remember. Uh, I remember everybody who was there. It was just, we, we had, I don't know what, maybe a hundred people from us, maybe a few hundred other people there, maybe more. It was just fantastic. So that's my favorite favorite club I went to in the last year, I guess, last year. Um, let's see, what's the best way to try to convince very skeptical computer scientists have actual use cases? Oh, look, I think I answered that question. This is why we crypto. That's why I'm doing this is why we crypto. You're going to get like Stephen Deals, right? Stephen Deal will uh you know these are people who who uh formed their opinions a long time ago they looked at bitcoin they looked at the narrative for bitcoin then they looked at bitcoin then they came away saying oh look this this narrative doesn't match this tech they are not wrong okay so the bitcoin narrative has changed over time and the, the narrative now matches the technology and um uh, and so uh, and there's much more uh, in play than what there used to be these are people who are not exactly early movers and they're not stragglers. And that's the problem. They come in at a time when they take a snapshot and then they shut down. And they think, okay, I understand this technology and it's shit and it's crap. And um, I don't know what to do about the people like this. They're not open-minded. And, uh, and of course, you know, they, um, but you give them time. They're slow, right? So they're not very fast moving. You give them time. In five years, Stephen Deal will be deeply embedded in the crypto space. I already see, uh, for example, early signs of him actually venturing into this space. You can't be a strong critic of a space without eventually realizing, hey, there is something here. Uh, it's just impossible. There is something there. So, uh, so give these people time. You don't have to personally convince them. But I want us to not ever lose sight of the fact that we are doing something unique and different than what other people can do. We have access to technology that they don't have access to. All right, GM, hi, hi, yes, LFG, yes. Any cool travel story? No, my cool travel story. I have a lot of travel stories, but most of them involve getting stuck at airports and so on. So um, uh, I'll think about the cool travel story. I don't know if I have a cool travel story off the top of my head. Um, yeah, most of my travel recently has, has been, uh, I, I keep flying back and forth. I have some, uh, uh, some uh, older family members that, uh, that have health issues. And so I keep going, traveling a bunch, uh, but it's, uh, it's just usually uh, I just you know put my earphones in and uh, and just go back and forth and uh, just sleep on the way and have severe jet lag on both both sides of the Atlantic. Um, would you say wag me just for the new? Yeah, wag me. That's clear. So there'll be all sorts of things. Now DCG is having issues. Fine. Genesis might have issues. It's the same group anyway. DCG Genesis. Fine. Um, you know uh, Genesis having issues. It's like, you know, is it the problem? No. Uh, will they get money clawed back for Alameda? I don't, who cares, right? At the end of the day, like, we will wake up to news of this kind. Will regulators go after Binance? Maybe. Is it going to be the end of the world? No. Um, will Tether collapse? I don't think so. Um, you know, there's going to be all sorts of issues like this. Just punt, you know, just, just, I just punt it all out. It's just not my concern. None of this affects what I'm doing at all. And uh, none of it should affect the market in the long term. So remember, uh, in the uh, ginormous railroad boom, more fortunes were made after the crash than before. Also, again, in the 90s, when everybody left what they were doing and they went into day trading dot com stocks. Remember those days? Sinbad was like on TV, you know, portraying some guy who was day trading. And everybody I knew was like starting a dinky little startup, not unlike all these L2s and crap. And none of them were destined for anywhere, but everybody was starting a, was starting a company, starting a dot-com. I was a grad student at the time, 
and uh, and all my friends who knew anything, you know, they would. You could write a. I remember. Uh, I'm not going to give names, but I remember people writing a 300 line Perl program and selling it for 30 million dollars, which was huge. It's probably 100 million by now. So you know, people were making money doing really crappy little things, left, right, and center, and it didn't seem right. And I bet you there were people, I mean, there were people back then saying this dot com thing is all a bubble, da da da, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's nothing here. Well, there was something there. We all knew there was something there, and there were so many fortunes made after the dot com crash. Look at where we are now. We have we have a differentiated space. We have a gazillion different companies. We have Amazon, a retailer. We have Amazon Web Services, which is a different kind of service. Uh, we have all sorts of other. We have social. We have dating apps, etc. We have like all sorts of verticals within the online services space. And uh, and we went from an undifferentiated soup to a highly differentiated rich market with a lot of value being created. That's going to happen in crypto as well. So wag me, it's so clear to me. Okay, um, English is the best. I uh, know, I mean, it's just a language. Um, it's, it's nice. Um, if you've studied a couple of other languages, you'll know that there are some that are are really, uh, really, really good and well structured. Um, English has a lot of exceptions, make it hard to, it makes it hard for kids to pick it up, by the way. It's very hard to write. Uh, the spelling rules are insanely complicated. Um, anyhow, so uh, my hair is looking bully. Oh, yeah, no. My, so I was traveling a lot and then I ended up cutting the sides myself. And so this is how, how it's looking today. Um, I, I travel too much to have, to have time uh, to, uh, to, to do anything. Okay, it's going to be our best year so far. I hope so, uh, Nicholas. And uh, I see no reason why not. It's uh, there will be ups and downs. There will be a lot of uh, you know, oh, crypto dead kind of articles. And uh, you guys know the the law. If if a if a if a newspaper article is, ends with a question mark, the answer is no. So uh, it's just a fundamental law of nature. So if they're asking the question, the answer is no. They're trying to clickbait you. And uh, no, it's not dead. We're here to stay. And uh, this is going to be a fantastic year for us. Next year is going to be even better. We need AVAX support on Ledger Live already. Yes, the Ledger folks are weird. And um, I love them. I've always liked them. And, uh, but I don't understand what happened with them, that uh, they, uh, they're taking their time. But, uh, but I think uh, that that support is imminent and coming. And I can't wait for it to be operational. So um, they, they certainly took their time uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to support us, which is kind of odd because I personally have done quite a bit to direct people to Ledger um, as opposed to any other hardware wallet manufacturer. And um, I, I trust the machines they build. And uh, I think they do a competent job in a space where there's a lot of incompetent things being done. So I like them. And um, uh, so I think they, they need to get their act together and... Uh, and uh, and support uh, Avalanche and Ledger Live, dude. Did we miss a whole intro? I don't know. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, go TM and yeah, I know, I know. This is kind of this is what we've got today. Um, okay, guys, stop making fun of my appearance. Yes, I know. Um, so let's see, Polycule Talk, yes, I, I, it's hard not to mention it, it comes up, it's, I wake up and Google ends up uh, populating my feed with all these news and uh, sure enough, there's some, some Sam news every day and uh, you would think that this crypto space is in, intimately tied to Sam. I, I know Sam, I've, I've met him multiple times, I've talked to him, I've ex exchanged messages with him and one of the things that struck me uh, behind the scenes and it should have been a red flag, and I was I was incredibly stupid. I didn't notice. I mean, I noticed this fact, but I didn't act on it like that. I didn't. I didn't really take the flag in my hand and wave it. But every time I spoke to him, he did not give a damn about technology. That was the one thing that struck out about him, is he didn't give a damn about whatever he was touching. And so he's out there. You know, when when he talks about technology, you can see that's very shallow. That he doesn't have a firm grasp of what's happening underneath, and. Um, and so it was evident when we spoke to him uh, every time, he just cared about things to trade. And, and ultimately that's what did him in, right? So he cared very much about his paper wealth. I could also see that. And normal people don't do that. Um, actual wealthy people don't care about their paper wealth. Uh, and actual working people don't care about wealth. They care about getting stuff done. 
So, so there was something odd about him all along. Uh, it's easy to see in retrospect. Um, and uh, I, it, it irked me at the time, uh, but I didn't know what, what, what to do or, or say about it. I was just like, this is kind of unusual for a guy who, who uh, went to MIT and uh, plays the, the brilliant young genius you know, archetype. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand a thing about the technology, nor does he care. If he cared, he would be able to pick it up, I guess. I guess. But, uh, but he didn't care. So it was interesting. Anyway, yeah, people are telling me to speak Turkish. I can't. It's just these these topics are not. Also, my audience is not. Does only you know they they speak English. So um, uh, let's see. Um, what else is going on? Uh, how to link wallet to Castle Crush? It should be if you use Core, it should be incredibly easy to use. Um, you to to use. Uh, uh, to use uh, to use core. All right. So um, yeah, people are sad. Yeah, okay. That, uh, that people are spamming this thing, asking me to speak Turkish. I don't quite understand um, this this desire. You know, I was in Turkey for a gazillion years. Like, don't get me upset about this. I was in Turkey for a gazillion years. I I would have happily stayed there. The food is great. My family was there, and uh, and and I love the the country there. Um, but uh, but there was there wasn't enough of a of, a, of an environment for scientists. And if you're a you know a, a world class scientist, it's it's an, it's very very difficult to to be in Turkey. So go back 20 years and change the 30 40 years 30 years and change the conditions, and then it would be a different universe where we all speak Turkish, and and people would be in the comments in English saying please speak English for us. But well, that's not the universe we live in, guys. So please don't spam. Um, it's getting tiring here. So um, let's see. Um, okay, I don't know what else. Yeah, there's there's captions available after the fact that people add. So if you want to read those, you can. Um, have we had any chance to deploy Avalanche on a quantum computer? No, we haven't. Quantum computing is a topic that comes up. Let me share with you what I think about it. So uh, the main thing to say about this is there are no practical computer, practical quantum computers right now. So um, it's uh, it's it's they, they don't do regular computation either. The, the value of a, of a quantum computer is in solving things we can't ordinarily do. So you don't want to run a word processor on a on a quantum computer, um, and uh, you don't want to do regular things like you know draw things or browse the internet on a quantum computer. It would that would happen no faster. Um, so what you want to do is do things that are hard on a regular computer, but are easy on a quantum computer. So what are these? Things like um, factoring a number. It's, that's great for a quantum computer, and, a, and a, on a real computer, on a regular computer, it takes, um, it, it, it takes time. So, uh, so and the worry about quantum computers is because they can do things um, quickly that are normally you know, time consuming, then could they be used to break certain uh, cryptographic guarantees? And uh, this is something we've thought deeply about. It's not something that I am concerned about in the next whatever many years. And uh, I have mentioned this before, but we have also done a prototype implementation of uh, uh, lattice based signatures that we haven't merged in yet because there's no need, because there aren't any uh, quantum computers that are capable. But, uh, but should quantum computers become possible and practical, then we can deploy lattice signatures, which are quantum computing resistant. So uh, the advantages that quantum computers have are erased when you use those signatures. So quantum computers at the moment have very small number of qubits. Uh, so that's one thing in our favor. So they cannot threaten any blockchain. The avalanche blockchain is even harder to threaten because what you have to do is you have to see the public key. You can't invert hashes with a quantum computer. You can, you can factor numbers, perhaps. You can factor other things if you have enough time, but, um, uh, but, but you can't invert hashes. So um, what that means is uh, for a fast chain like Avalanche, you have a tiny window when you see the public key uh, until um, the the transaction is uh, is uh, is immortalized on the blockchain to factor the number, come up with an alternative transaction, and then get that accepted. So our vulnerability to, to quantum computers is is just infinitesimally lower than other chains 
where these kinds of um, public keys are revealed uh, far more, uh, you know, for, for longer durations. So for example, Bitcoin would give you 10 minutes of, uh, of quantum computing time, whereas Avalanche gives you one second. So you can do the math there, uh, we were 600 times uh, less vulnerable. So uh, if, if Bitcoin is vulnerable, quantum computers would have to then get faster by a factor of 600, 600 before we're worried. And even then, then they would have to race in the network. So, um, uh, so thoughts on the Shopify collaboration. Maybe that's a good, good note to end on. Uh, we just announced our collaboration with Shopify. So if you're a Shopify merchant, you can very easily and very quickly issue your NFTs. And uh, that's just uh, what the platform provides for you now. And I think we're the number one chain for this. Maybe not. Maybe they tried it before with another chain that doesn't work or whatever. But, uh, uh, but we, I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, NFTs are a great way to, uh, to do a lot of things. I mentioned the credential use cases for NFTs. Another thing that you can do is, is um, loyalty points, identification of people who are uh, frequent customers or special customers, and uh, creating any kind of a brand collaboration between consumers and manufacturers. So Shopify uh, merchants can, can create, a, you know, essentially they, by, by giving out NFTs, you create a lot of goodwill. You create a secondary market for these things, et cetera. And if done right by a good marketing team, they are an incredibly valuable tool. So I'm really excited about that collaboration and um, I'm really thrilled to be in there. And we're one of the chains, I think we are obviously the chain that does the most in terms of technical innovation. And coupled with that, we are also one of the chains that does quite a lot of business development and partnerships. And there just isn't another chain like that. So I'm really, really happy about where we are uh, as, a, as, a, as a community. And I, and I cannot wait to see what happens in the rest of this year um, as, a, as a result of our collective efforts to build the best technology, to, to collaborate with whoever it is that's doing something exciting in the blockchain space, to deliver to them subnets uh, customized for their own use cases, chains de uh, developed specifically for different applications. And in total, I think the offering here is, is just immensely ahead of everybody else. If you look at what's going on, um, and you measure it not in the number of words or number of, of funky equations, et cetera, but in terms of actual tech you can use, we are far ahead of our competition. People are trying to get to single slot finality. We already have that. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to write a blog post to you guys with equations in it or whatnot. And, uh, and I think you know, I've mentioned this before as well. There is no number of, of, of you know, I, I know how to write a lot of blog posts with Greek letters, okay? I know how to write blog posts with all sorts of fancy characters. And I was never in the business of selling hopes and dreams. We never did that. We were always in the business of selling concrete tech that works. And that's one of the biggest differentiators between us and our competitors. We have what they are trying to achieve. We have what they are trying to get to after umpteen years of effort. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a really nice situation to be in. So um, my, my hope and my parting message to you is we're going to get all sorts of, uh, of uh, detracting news from all sorts of people about, about the crypto space and so on in the aftermath of something like the FTX failure. Pay no mind. Uh, it'll all go away at some point. In two years, people are going to be still trying to trade their FTX claims and so on. There's going to be a lot of noise. It's just, you know, he's still going to be in the news, etc. But it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter today and it won't matter at all then. So what does matter is the tech and the use cases. And they're ample. The use cases are ample and the tech is ready to meet them. So I'm really excited about the year to come and I hope you are too. So thank you very much for listening to me. Hope to talk to you next week.